Chapter 14 In the summer of 1940, the war came to the skies over Great Britain. Newspapers were awash in headlines of dogfights between the German Luftwaffe and the British Royal Air Force. The coastline of southern England was hit first as the Germans went after airfields and radar installations. On September 7th, the London Blitz had begun. Over the next 48 hours, the children of Willesden Lane went back and forth day and night into the shelter. When the weekend was over, 2,000 tons of bombs had been dropped onto the docks in the industrial area of the Cockney Heart of London, right in the neighborhood of Platts and Sons. As the weeks went on, wave after wave of bombs continued their assault on the East End. In one terrible night alone there were a thousand fires. Workers began grumbling that their neighborhood was taking the beating for the whole country. Lisa and Gina and the other workers started leaving early so that they could make the trip home before the sirens went off again. Lisa would run into the hostel and grab as many precious minutes on the piano as she could before another siren would blast. One night, after an all-clear, they picked up leaflets that had fallen from the sky. A last appeal to reason, one read. The text was by Adolf Hitler and urged the English to give up before they were obliterated. Everyone laughed, but Lisa couldn't help wondering if the joke was on them. When When Britain gradually got the upper hand in the daytime, downing one Nazi bomber after another, the Germans switched and bombed only at night. They had learned a costly lesson. This would not be the quick victory they had expected. For the first time since 1936, they couldn't roll in and over a country in a matter of weeks. In a fit of patriotic fervor, Johnny announced that he had signed up for the rescue squad. He showed off his metal helmet proudly, its large letter R painted across it. "'You're only 15, John,' Mrs. Cohen said, chastising him. "'I wasn't asked my age, ma'am.' He replied, only my weight, he added, provoking giggles from the group. Johnny was enormously strong, and God knew the rescue squad could use him. Lisa went up and gave him a patriotic kiss. One night, huddled in the shelter, Lisa tried to figure out how she, too, could help the war effort. What could she do? She wasn't strong like Johnny. All she could do was play music. Suddenly it hit her. She could help raise morale by organizing a musical, a little concert of classical music and popular songs, and invite refugees from another hostel. The matron gave her approval. Everyone was very excited. It gave them a sense of patriotic purpose. Lisa asked for suggestions from Mrs. McRae about popular songs, and people at work donated sheet music. Lisa's favorite was, Oh Soldier, Who's Your Lady Love? Hans agreed to play his favorite, Be Like the Kettle and Sing, which he had memorized from the BBC broadcasts. Gina wanted to help. Let me sing the words. You can't sing, Lisa said without thinking. I can too. You just don't want anyone else to get any attention. Gina pouted for several days until, realizing the program wouldn't be the same without her friend's enthusiasm, Lisa groveled and begged her to sing. They all stayed at the piano, practicing until the last seconds of the now daily air raid blast, then had to be dragged by the matron into the shelter, still singing as loudly as they could. The musical was scheduled for New Year's Day, 1941. Mrs. Glazer had been hoarding butter so that she could make mincemeat pies, and the other hostel forwarded two weeks' ration coupons for sugar. Gina was in good voice, only half-joking that she was considering a singing career, and Gunther scrounged up a pair of castanets. Edith borrowed a neighbor's oboe and learned the five most relevant notes, while Johnny beat the time on his metal helmet. A week's lull in the bombing raised everyone's spirits and enabled the entertainers to put the finishing touches on their music program. But on December 29th, the air raid siren sounded once again in the middle of the evening practice. Everyone moaned and grabbed their books and the chessboard and headed underneath the ground. Everyone but Lisa. She was fed up with the horrible shelter. She needed to keep practicing. She played feverishly, her cords, her only ammunition. She played with such intensity that she couldn't hear that the bombs were coming ever, ever closer. 
Suddenly, there was a deafening crash, and the force of the bomb's concussion threw Lisa from the piano and smashed her against the living room wall. The glass of the bay window shattered and sent splinters showering across the room. Lisa lay on the floor, wondering if she was dead. She looked at her hands first. The fingers moved, and so did the arms. She did a muscle-by-muscle inventory and discovered that everything worked. She was covered in dust and splinters, but could discover no blood, so she stood up slowly. Instead of being terrified, she suddenly felt calm. These bombs can't hurt me, she told herself. She was fine. The piano was fine. The door flew open and Aaron and Gunter ran in. Lisa, are you all right? They yelled in unison. Just fine. You can tell Mr. Hitler I'm just fine. I'll tell Mr. Hitler that you're crazy. Now let's go. Aaron shouted angrily. She had never seen him so upset. Another wave of airplanes was approaching. Aaron and Gunter each seized one of her arms, lifting her up and over the glass and back to the shelter. Once underground, Mrs. Cohen grabbed Lisa, clasping her to her chest in relief. Releasing her, Mrs. Cohen scanned her charge from head to toe, making sure she was intact. Satisfied that Lisa was unharmed, she railed, "'We are at war, young lady!' It is not the time to take foolish risks. I have to send two boys to find you. You could have been killed. Never, never do that again. Lisa apologized, too overcome to try to explain herself, and set about comforting the younger children. The raid lasted another six long hours. It was dawn when the neighborhood emerged from its shelters. The smell of smoke hung in the air with the dust and the fog. Four houses on the block, including the hostel, had been hit and rescue crews were looking for the residents of 239. Their backyard had taken a direct hit, and the shelter was covered with bricks and debris. Firemen were frantically digging them out. Everyone held their breath until finally the dusty man and wife appeared at the entrance and waved. Willisden Lane cheered. They'd been lucky. Lisa and Gina stood on the sidewalk and watched the firemen inspect the hostel. A hole was ripped through the roof, and windows were completely blown out. When the firemen came out and gave the thumbs up, Lisa joined a dozen others in rushing back into the building. Be careful, there's broken glass all around, Mrs. Cohen yelled, but nothing she said could stop them. Lisa had only one thought. Where were the photos of her mother and father? She ran into her bedroom. Yanking open the drawer of the bureau, she pulled out the pictures, still intact, not even damp. She read for the millionth time, Von Diene Nietzsche Fergense Mutter, from the mother who will never forget you. I'm safe, Mama, she whispered, hoping to communicate across the distance to wherever her mother was. She wished so much she had news of her. Where could she be? Mrs. Cohen pulled her from her thoughts by tugging gently on her sleeve. Please hurry, Lisa, pack your things, we have to go. The 32 children were led to the community shelter to spend the night. They were officially homeless once again.